up, everyone? Welcome to the Young Turks. I'm Anna Kasparian. Jenk is out today, but we have a wonderful panel. Maythal Hassan. I love. I'm so happy you're here. Um, we're going to talk about Syria later, um, and I think that your perspective is so important Thank since you. you cover these issues in in a lot of detail. And of course, Mark Thompson, who's wonderful and. I'm so happy you're here as well. Uh, Mark Thompson has a wonderful podcast that you should check out. It's called The Edge with Mark Thompson. Please take a listen, it's great and it covers all sorts of topics ranging from politics to other issues that I wish we had time to talk about on this show, but- Thank you, Anna, that's <laughs> the, so kind. The yeah. political news cycle is so out of control. That yes. is for sure. So with that said, um, I'm gonna jump right into the news today and we're gonna start off with Syria. Let someone else fight over this long bloodstained sand. That's Donald Trump characterizing Syria as nothing more than bloodstained sand. He had a press conference today in which he spouted a number of lies about his terrible decisions in Syria, particularly northern Syria. He not only lied to the American public, but he also took a victory lap as if his decisions were great for the Kurdish allies that he abandoned abruptly after one phone call with the president of Turkey, Erdogan. So let's go to the first video that gives you a sense of how he feels about Syria and the types of lies he spouted throughout this press conference. When we commit American troops to battle, we must do so only when a vital national interest is at stake. The nations in the region must ultimately take on the responsibility of helping Turkey and Syria police their border. We want other nations to get involved. We've secured the oil and therefore a small number of US troops will remain in the area where they have the oil. So I actually want to apologize to you guys because that video included the statements where he was telling the truth. That video included the statements where he's essentially saying, yeah, I want other countries to come in and do what they wanna do. As long as we have control of the oil, who cares about our Kurdish allies? Who cares about whether or not they feel abandoned, whether or not they'll be slaughtered, whether or not they'll be victimized by ethnic cleansing at the hands of the Turkish government, who cares? We got hold of the oil, that's all that matters. So that was actually the most honest part of his press conference. But then later when he starts talking about the Kurds, that's when you get a sense that he is, of course, peddling all sorts of lies. Now, let me talk a little bit about the countries who are involved in this conflict in northern Syria. So apparently, Russia and Turkey are now working together. One day earlier, Russia and Turkey agreed to a plan to push Syrian Kurdish fighters from a wide swath of territory just south of Turkey's border, cementing Russian President Vladimir Putin's preeminent role in Syrian in Syria as American troops depart and US influence wanes. Now I wanna be clear about something, I don't care about US influence. I think US influence in the Middle East has been a complete and utter disaster. But our relationship with the Kurds in Northern Syria was important. Noam Chomsky even cited it as one of the things that we were doing right, working with the Kurds in order to deal with the very real problem we were having with ISIS. Not only did the Kurdish fighters fight on our behalf, they were guarding ISIS fighters that had already been detained in these prisons. And so Donald Trump just abandoning them is the issue that I have. But As always, the hawkish media likes to talk about US influence. It's not about US influence, it's about staying committed to the promises that we made to our allies. Yeah, there's so much to this story to try to unravel because it was just filled with not only lies, but tropes and traps that were very intentional talking points and dog whistles to his base. One thing that I do wanna highlight is that Again and again, we are framing this region as one in incredibly simplistic terms and also in a national security framing that disconnects our culpability to the region. So we're not there just because we're trying to help the Kurds ward off ISIL. Why is ISIL even there? Because there was a destabilization that got brought on by the invasion in 2003, Mm -hmm. wherein ISIL, wherein Al Qaeda did not exist, but but was born in response to the aggressive militarization and occupation and takeover of Iraq. And that, what people didn't see because we didn't keep our eyes on what happened to the rest of the region. So Trump wants to talk about the responsibility of other nations dealing with what was happening in Syria. Well, 
they were they were taking full responsibility for what we did in in Iraq. So Syrians absorbed a large portion of Iraqi refugees during that time period, and they didn't have the infrastructure to support them. So when there is an overspill of a group of people that I refer to as mercenaries, because I don't like this language of Islamic fundamentalism or the way that we're we're framing them in in terms of being terrorists and Muslim terrorists, they're mercenaries. Um, and they took advantage of an opportunity where there was a vacuum. And not only are the Kurds, were they fighting off what we created, they're fighting off the Syrian regime. And that gets lost in the conversation as well, because mm -hmm. the Syrian regime was responsible, like the, like Turkey was too, for repressing them. Tur Kurdish people in Syria were not allowed to speak Kurdish. Right. They were not even allowed to have um, citizenship. And they couldn't name their children Kurdish names. So this was news to me when I started to put together a book in 2012 about the uprisings in the region. And Kurdish folks are fighting for their life because they have multiple forces trying to extinguish them. But I also wanna say, just closing this off, um, that there are a lot of other ethnicities that are being slaughtered too that nobody's thinking about, which is the Yazidis, the Assyrians. The Assyrians were the ones who fled the Turkish genocide and settled this area and created a little bit of a buffer. And again, we're not talking about them. Um, so I just, I wanna put those voices at the center. And I do wanna say that, um, that w w there's a different way we could be talking about this story, but we're taking our lead from not only the Trump-like figures, but the rest of American imperialism that wants to really divorce itself from its culpability. Well, yeah. a lot of the narrative is being dictated by Washington, and so it's in response to that narrative that I think a lot of our uh, our rhetoric uh, gets dictated. Uh, but but I'm glad you mentioned sort of the long uh, oppressed Kurdish minority, and you mentioned these other minorities, which I must be honest, I had forgotten even in the yeah, uh, and our Armenians. I don't want to forget that yeah. too. In the cloud of all of this, uh, from a politically uh, uh, bizarre are sort of uh, the tactic that they've taken, but it, this is the strategy. It's his uh, mission accomplished moment. You yes, know, that's yeah. really what Donald Trump has done here. He's taken a situation which is a loser, and even his own military and Pentagon didn't want any part of it. And he's doing that mission accomplished. Hey, well, we did it, so everything's good, and let those guys fight over it. But our role in this region is done and successful. And if he says it loud enough and big enough and with enough American flags around him, maybe people will believe it. That's what he's doing there, plain and simple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have um, some more video elements that I really want you guys to comment on. So let's go to uh, the next clip. This is uh, Donald Trump uh, mentioning how his actions uh, led to a more peaceful situation between the Turks and the Kurds in northern Syria. Today's announcement validates our course of action with Turkey that only a couple of weeks ago was scorned. And now people are saying, wow, what a great outcome. <laughs> wow. Wow. wow, I mean, it, that lie, he doesn't even buy his own lies. Yeah. I mean, oh. you can just tell. but. This is what he does over and over again. So he will make some sort of abrupt decision without talking to anyone in his administration, without talking to the Pentagon, without having a single intelligence briefing on it. He'll just have a discussion with a world leader and then abruptly make these decisions, which lead to an escalation in violence. Understand that at the time before Donald Trump made this decision, that area was relatively peaceful considering the US presence there, protecting the Kurdish allies. And then when he made the decision to pull US troops out of the region, that led to an incredible amount of violence between the Turks coming in to northern Syria and the Kurdish forces there. So he like messes up the situation and then he has his administration go in and try to clean up the mess. And that's what they allegedly did with an alleged ceasefire. And then he says, you see that? I, what I did led to peace in this area. <laughs> and it's so for us, he did that with North Korea. He's done it with so many different foreign policy situations. And I also want to note that in this press conference, he, he said that he will lift the sanctions that he implemented against Turkey just last week. Now those sanctions, were so weak that Erdogan laughed at them. And so, wow, you're gonna lift those incredibly flimsy you know, sanctions that Erdogan doesn't even care about. But one thing that did stand out to me, and I wanted to get your thoughts on this is, 
you know, if you're paying close attention to this story and you understand the nuances and the complexity of it, then you know he's lying. But for the average American who watches that yeah. press conference, he uses a talking point that's very effective. Enough with these regime change wars. And that's all you need to say. Right. And and people both on the left and the right sign on to it without really understanding, you know, what the commitment to Kurdish allies were and how these are people who have been used and abused and thrown away time and time again. Right. Yeah, I listened to this press conference first with my ears and then second with his base or a base that he is trying to win over. And that's when I saw that what he was saying was probably effective to them, unfortunately, even though it was riddled with contradictions in 15 minutes. So one part of what he was saying was that Obama and his administration were interested in regime regime change around Bashar al-Assad. Well, that's not the case because Obama had many opportunities to engage in regime change and actually my contacts on the ground, their assessment of what was happening was that the US was protracting conflict to sell weapons. Mm -hmm. And that's that's pretty much bipartisan, every regime in the US does that. Um, and then there is regime change for other reasons, usually around American corporate interest or imperialism and or neoliberal policies. But that probably was effective to them. And then he then said, well, you know, I drew a red line and I responded when there was chemical attacks, except that he he did strikes or targeted empty warehouses. So clearly he wasn't trying to infringe on his partner Putin, who is very closely aligned with Assad. So all of that is just talking points, it's mere talking points. And the other thing that he mentioned, which again was trying to really distance himself from any responsibility in the region was that, you know, these guys, they, this is thousands of years of sectarian conflict. This is thousands of years of fighting with each other. And we can't be involved in this. This is not where our money should go, except now I'm putting in trillions of dollars to our military. Yes, and not only that, I mean, while he tries to make the case that he is trying to pull back from US involvement and intervention abroad. In reality, he just sent nearly 2000 troops, 1800 to be exact, to Saudi Arabia. Yep. Why did he do that? And he is taking these US troops out of northern Syria and he's trying to station them where? In Iraq. And the Iraqi government is like, no, we don't want this. And so now Defense Secretary Mark Esper is traveling to Iraq to try to negotiate with the government there to get them to accept the US troops into their country. So he is not in any way scaling back US involvement abroad. If anything, he's actually amplifying yep. war abroad, especially when it comes to Yemen. So anything that you hear about, oh, I'm against these regime change wars, it's complete and utter nonsense. He was very honest in the first clip we showed you. He will do what's necessary for US interests. But when it comes to fulfilling our commitments to our allies abroad and protecting them from being slaughtered, doesn't care too much about that. We've never had as many troops in the Middle East as we, uh, I should put it this way, uh, at the end of, there are many more uh, troops in the Middle East now than there were at the end of the Obama administration. So to whatever extent you wanna you know, look at, uh, as, as Anna says, uh, Donald Trump as this uh, 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 leading the parade, getting troops out of the region, it's just not happening. The troop numbers are rising under Trump as, uh, again, to reiterate, uh, more than there were at the end of the Obama administration. So uh, yeah, he, uh, look, it's tough to even fathom all the different facets of this situation. But clearly, Donald Trump is a guy who just showed up to this press conference, declared mission accomplished, read some stuff off the prompter, ad lib stuff that made no sense at all, of course. And uh, and then he goes uh, to go play some golf or so. I don't mean to, to make it too cartoonish, but I guess what I'm trying to say is he's not really engaged yeah. in this crisis in any sort of strategic way apart from the political. And then finally, I have one more video to show you, and this was the most brazen lie. Uh, let's take a look. I have just spoken to General Maslum, a wonderful man, the commander in chief of the SDF Kurds. And he was extremely thankful for what the United States has done. Could not have been more thankful. General Maslum has assured me that ISIS is under very, very strict lock and key. And the detention facilities are being strongly maintained. Uh, there were a few that got out, a small number, relatively speaking. And they've been largely recaptured. I'm also sure that he will be issuing his own statement very shortly. 
We had a great talk, but we've saved the lives of many, many Kurds. He understands that. I just want to note that previously Donald Trump claimed that the Kurds purposely released ISIS fighters from these prisons in order to send a message to Donald Trump. That wasn't rooted in any fact, there was no evidence for that. But he insulted the Kurds by alleging that they purposely did that. And now he's saying that oh, some of the Kurds got away, but we captured them again. I don't believe anything he says says in that regard. But one other thing, when he says that the Kurds are very happy with us, we kept them safe. <laughs> that. Of course, is a complete and utter lie. So going back to the deal between Russia and Turkey and their influence in northern Syria, the agreement that these two countries had will put Turkey and Russia in control of territory that was formally held by Kurdish forces once allied with the United States. And as part of that deal negotiated by both Erdogan and Putin, Turkey will get a nearly 20 mile deep safe zone along its border clear of Kurdish militias. Right, and also let's decode that for a second. Again, there is really no um, no sort of culpability for Bashar al-Assad. So the reason why the Kurds were fighting initially was against the Syrian regime. And so ISIL troops came in and then the US government decided that they would support the Kurds because for whatever reason, ISIL is the most frightening thing to Americans when there are more KKK members in the US than there are ISIL fighters. Um, and so that's yeah. that's the talking point that they love because it allows them to use a counterterrorism rhetoric that allows them to also talk about more of a military occupation in the region. So um, we should also remember that when they're saying that Russians get control of that area, everything that the Kurds fought for just died. Not only was there a potential massacre because of, of Turkey coming in, um, but Russia taking over means that the regime just re-entrenched itself as well. And then one final point that I wanted to make, and this is according to USA Today, Trump's top envoy for Syria, James Jeffrey, conceded that Turkey may have committed war crimes against the Kurds in their assault. He may have been referring to the assassination of Kurdish politician Hevrin Kalaf. So you have members of Trump's administration saying one thing, accusing the Turks of committing war crimes against the Kurds. I mean, a Kurdish politician was assassinated. And then on the other hand, you have Donald Trump doing this press conference and making himself out to be this giant peacemaker. But the facts don't bear that out. And what I worry about is his anti-war rhetoric, which is not rooted in fact, is gonna resonate with people who aren't paying attention. I think just the last point is sort of the first point. And Anna, you made it, and that is, this was an impetuous decision made with, and we could speculate, I think, for some time about why, but made with with no notice really to the Pentagon, got tremendous pushback. And now what we're seeing, what this is all about today is the spin, as Anna said, the cleanup that is forced and it's all political. And to your final point, He's hoping that by hammering that mission accomplished, look what we did, I'm getting us out of these regime change wars, that that's the sort of lingering memory of this entire incident. We gotta take a break and when we come back, we have some more international news, including the protests in Chile. And later in the show, in the second hour, we are gonna talk about AOC grilling Mark Zuckerberg, which was incredible. He did testify before members of the house today and embarrassed himself quite a bit. We'll be right back. We hope you're enjoying this free clip from the Young Turks. If you want to get the whole show and more exclusive content while supporting independent media, become a member at tyt.com slash join today. In the meantime, enjoy this free segment. Welcome back to TYT, we're about to get to some more international news, but I wanted to give you guys some announcements, some updates, and then we'd move on. So the conversation has some awesome guests. In fact, tonight, the legendary Naomi Klein will be on the conversation. That's after the second hour of the show, please check that out. I'm really looking forward to it. And then later, Jabil Smith, a senior writer at Rolling Stone who covers national affairs and culture will be on the conversation this week, this Thursday specifically. Tune in at 8 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. Pacific at tyt.com slash live. 
And then finally, um, the power panels, we're trying to uh, you know, direct our audience to different platforms. And so the power panel on Friday will not be on YouTube, but it will be on YouTube TV, the Roku channel, uh, Pluto TV, Zumo, all of these various platforms that you see on this uh, graphic right now, you can, you can watch the show there. And if you're a member, as always, you can watch the show either on our app or you can watch online on our website. So members get extra benefits because they help keep us afloat. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So thank you so much for supporting the show. And yeah, that's what I have for you. You guys ready for some more news? Let's do it. Let's do it. Make it happen. Oh, this is devastating, but it shows you what wealth inequality and income inequality does. So. 15 people have died in Chile so far in violent clashes with the government. This follows widespread protests regarding inequality in the country. Now, if you look at past mainstream media news coverage on Chile and its economy, the presentation is that it has this robust, vibrant economy. It's so successful, things are great. But in reality, Chile has been dealing with something that's very similar to what Americans have been dealing with. While the economy has done well for a small number of elites at the very top, the vast majority of Chileans have been suffering from inequality. And the straw that really broke the camel's back was a 4% increase in subway fares. Now, um, rather than putting words in the mouths of the protesters, why don't we go ahead and hear from the protesters themselves. For protesters, the demonstrations and their frustrations are about so much more than a pricier metro ticket. They are years of repression. They are years of living in misery. They are years of government imposed measures at the expense of the people. Though Chile is Latin America's wealthiest country, it also has one of the highest levels of economic inequality in the world. People are frustrated by what they call a lack of economic reform on a number of topics, including pensions, health care, and public education. There's also concern about government overreach, as on Sunday, authorities imposed a curfew. Some 10,000 police and armed soldiers were deployed. So, of course, as always, the protesters are met with incredible violence. And the video that we're about to show you is graphic, I want to warn you. But it gives you a sense of the type of resistance the protesters are met with. Again, this is graphic, take a look. La media cagada. ¡Va un gallo! ¡Lo atropellaron! Oh. Have the government running protesters over in an effort to silence them. Labor unions have gotten involved now. They have started to strike. The government has implemented a curfew. Anyone seen outside past 11 p.m. will deal with the consequences, but the protesters remain defiant. Yeah, and I'm so glad you're doing this story because not only is this a microcosm for what is happening globally, you know, there are protests going on in Lebanon for similar reasons, and I want to break that down in a second. But we saw this also happen with protests and resistance in Sudan and Algeria earlier in the summer. And so the the violence that you saw there in the previous clip is reminiscent of a time in the 70s and in the 80s mm -hmm. when there was a really severe military junta in power, Pinochet, who was tried on international crimes and actually evaded it by being a fugitive in another country. But that his rise was the reason for this moment. The culmination of the protest isn't because of a fee hike in the metro passes and the way that it's portrayed in the media that it's this minor fee hike. It is part of the tipping point to a package of austerity measures that were very much influenced by something called neoliberalism, which is is also known as free market fundamentalism. And the key thinkers of this type of economic policy is Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman influenced a group of folks called the Chicago Boys, mm -hmm. who were Chileans that were trained under him at the University of Chicago, and then implemented this really horrifying neoliberal agenda for Chile, where there was a developed booming economy, mm -hmm. but 
there was growing, growing wealth disparity. And what that translated into, so I'll give you an example of what Milton Friedman believes. And he argues that there is a natural unemployment rate. And if we dip below that unemployment rate, which means there are less people who are unemployed, it means that inflation will accelerate. So they are going for a certain amount of unemployment. And they are trying to hit you in the jugular with austerity measures to make the economy favorable to basically American corporations right. at that time period. And and the United States has been very much involved in, in countries like Chile. Uh, you know, Nixon was very much behind uh, the coup d'etat that took place uh, and uh, removed the socialist president uh, Salvador Allende from power. Yes. And so, uh, you know, the CIA, the US CIA, I, they have gone in and uh, purposely uh, assisted with these types of coups to overthrow individuals who, the US saw as a threat to business interests. Right, and I just wanna say, when we talk about 9-11 for Chileans, September 11th, 1973, when a democratically elected Allende was deposed by the military junta that Pinochet led, that was a dark day for Chileans because it set all of this into motion mm -hmm. as well. And, and I mean, Pinochet, the brutality under Pinochet is, is, is legend and story. But there's another part of this, I think, and it relates to America. And that's the the disparity in in wages and the disparity economically. You're seeing a power in Chile. I mean, this is 18 million people, and they've had this incredible boom economically. At least it's perceived that way, as Anna was just saying. And yet, so many are not participating in that boom, right? So now you have this downtick, and the economy's gotten a little soft. And everybody who was disenfranchised from the boom is even more disenfranchised during this economically lean time. Uh, so now to our country, where we also have an increasing disparity, the haves and have nots, the gaps uh, have gotten bigger. And so uh, am I saying that you know we're looking into a crystal ball as to what might happen in America? In a way I am, when I certainly think it's a warning shot that you know this is the result of tremendous economic disparity and and that when that when that gap gets so big that people feel a sense of oppression economically you do get this pushback and that's what's happening in Chile so what's interesting is you know I had a conversation about this with my mom last night and and so I brought up uh, you know the unrest in Chile in Lebanon people rising up uh, especially in response to inequality and the lack of economic opportunities and Armenia just went through uh, its own peaceful revolution and referred to as the Velvet Revolution. My mom, who grew up under you know Soviet rule in Armenia, was like, "There's something about Americans; they just will not rise up." And I think it's because we—I don't think it's because of the people. I think that we have this entire infrastructure put in place that immediately minimizes and belittles any type of movement. I mean, you see it right now when it comes to Bernie Sanders and the progressive ideals that he's pushed forward, right? And with the, you know, with the rhetoric that you see in our media in response to the ideas that progressives have that would actually do away with inequality. Like it's just it's really difficult to get people to mobilize people and to unite people. We're so divided when in reality the issues that we're frustrated about we, we share that commonality. Yeah, but I would also argue that the way the media portrays uprisings as riots, mm -hmm. we can't see when those moments are happening. So 1992, the uprising that happened might have been in response to Rodney King, but it was actually about the t deterioration of neighborhoods as a result of extreme divestment from the industrial um, the industrial boom that had happened in Compton, but then withdraw because of outsourcing jobs. Mm -hmm. And that people felt that, that's why they were looting local stores because they saw people taking over their neighborhoods and no jobs being available. And on top of that, they were being attacked and brutalized by police. So that moment is a moment of uprisings, same with the Watts riots as well and um, in, in um, uh, Detroit. So those uprisings are moments, but we have to be able to read them in that way. In the same way that you wa you're watching American media coverage call these riots in response to a fee hike for the Metro. But again, they weren't looking at the fact that it was mostly students who were hopping across turnstiles as a form of protest. Yeah. And then it was the state's forces responding violently that then had folks burning up the subway station. And that's what we forget, that's how. That's actually a textbook of how it happens everywhere around the world, including Syria, is that the state responds violently with tear gas, um, with 
actually, which is something that's internationally unlawful. It was banned in 1997, and then people resort to whatever is left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just to go back to the point, and I see it all the time, the media constantly referring to this as people who are upset about a fair hike. No, that's just the straw that broke the camel's back. It reminds me very much of how the media covered the yellow vest movement in France, right? They made it appear as though they were upset over a gas tax and that was it. And and that message was then co-opted by the right wing in America to spread this message of see, taxes are unpopular, don't <laughs> raise taxes. But it wasn't just about raising taxes. That was the straw that broke the camel's back in France. And you know, the people of France are very politically active and, and they'll rise up the second they feel that uh, there's this push for austerity or anything that could lead to more inequality. Thank uh, you, that's a great, con yeah, I'm glad yeah. you made that point because that's a great contrast to the US. I mean, there really is a, a sense in Europe that this is there's an activism there. There's a let's take to the streets there that you just don't yeah. find in the US. Well, we, we yeah. did have that when unions were stronger, mm -hmm. right? So there was, a, there was a historic sort of um, deal that was struck with GM employees. They were able to negotiate negotiate what they needed, but it was the unions were very much crippled by Reagan, who ended up firing um, all the air traffic controllers. You remember that moment? That was when he really flexed his arm and they were protesting, they were on strike. And then he said, guess what? I'm not neg negotiating with you guys, I'm gonna fire you all. And that sent a shock wave mm -hmm. to labor and to union organizers. So this has been in the mix for a while in the US, is us getting accustomed to dis extreme economic discomfort. And I do want to give you one more quote from one of the protesters. This is an Uber driver who complained that he's unable to pay his student debt. Does that sound familiar? And can't provide a decent life for his family. He told the Associated Press, quote, I'm protesting for my daughter, for my wife, for my mother, not just for the 30 pesos of the Metro, for the low salaries, for the privileges of the political class, for their millionaire salaries. It's just there's so many parallels. Exactly. You know, and, and, exactly. And you know, uh, solidarity with the Chilean protesters. Um, there's a brutal fight ahead, and we're seeing this type of unrest in other countries, including Lebanon. And this is something that a lot of people are dealing with. You're you're so right. This virus, this Friedman ideology that spread throughout the the world with the assistance of the United States has been so destructive to people, and the way that you know, economic prosperity has been reported in places like Chile. It's a lie, it's a lie. You gotta look at the real numbers and it's a lie here in the United States as well. When they talk about the GDP and how we're doing so well economically, you gotta look into things like, all right, well, consumer spending. How is consumer spending done? People are taking out more and more debt in order to provide for themselves, sure. right? Uh, the the rise that you see in, in stocks, What's causing that? Is it because consumers have disposable income to go out there and stimulate the economy? No, oftentimes if you look hard enough, you'll see corporate stock buybacks contributing quite a bit to that. Yeah, and who's participating in that stock market? I mean, fewer exactly. and fewer people are, are, are participating. The last thing I would say about activism, just because this is Bernie yeah. country, I would say that the reminder of how you can energize a generation to activism is that Bernie Sanders rally. I mean, if you could yes. look at that, I mean, this is on a weekend. People have got a lot of other stuff to do, and uh, you know, so many dings on young people. But I'm telling the huge chunk of young people, and then multi generational uh, Bernie support. So right. I think Bernie reminds us also the Dakota Pipeline. Uh, w w those people were dogged in their protest around it. It does exist in America. It just doesn't quite exist with quite the fervor I would like to see. Right, and the unity. I think that's the biggest issue. Yeah, we I, need unity. I think that the the difference is that the. Neoliberal kleptocracy is recognized across political parties, like we were talking about in Lebanon. It's now gone beyond sectarian divide, and all these groups of people that were divided because of the civil war over there are united together. But it's the the far right that doesn't want to recognize that it actually has something similar and in solidarity with their class peers. And once they realize that, then. I think there would be a really powerful movement in the US. All right, we gotta take a break. When we come back, we'll focus on domestic politics, including an update on the impeachment investigation.